going to talk about a recipe for the next Great Depression. And uh, I'm going to recommend a book. I'm not sure if it's for sale out there or not, but it's a friend of ours named Jim Powell who wrote this book called FDR's Folly a couple of years ago. And, uh, and what Jim is good at is, uh, uh, and he was a student of uh, Hayek, of Friedrich Hayek, back at the University of Chicago way back when. And what he's good at is he, he read about 50 years of academic research on the effects of the New Deal on, on the economy and summarized it in very readable language in this book, FDR's Folly. And so it's a great resource if you want to know uh, you know, what was the effect of the Tennessee Valley Authority during the, during the New Deal years, during the Great Depression? What was the effect of the creation of the FDIC and so forth? You know, chapter after chapter. And uh, at the end of the book, the last chapter, after summarizing 50 years of research, and, and it's, it's all footnoted there, you know, hundreds of footnotes to academic, uh, you know, boring academic literature in, in this, if you want to pursue that. The last chapter gives, uh, you know, lessons we should have learned from the New Deal, you know what what mistakes were made in those days by FDR and his uh, regime uh, that we should not repeat, and so uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some of these. Uh, and lesson number one here is, and I'll quote Jim Powell. He said, "Quote the basic problem with central banks." is that like socialist economic planners, they can never have more than a fraction of the vast knowledge needed to make a society work, knowledge that is dispersed in the minds of millions of people. In addition, when central bankers make mistakes, as they inevitably will, since they are human beings, these mistakes harm not just the economy in a city or a region, but the entire country, end quote. Uh, you know, we certainly, certainly ought to know that now, today, in today's, today's world. And this, he's basically parroting, um, much of the life's work of Friedrich Hayek. Uh, that's, this is the, the famous, uh, Hayekian knowledge problem that he's talking about. That, uh, Hayek called it the pretense of knowledge. He believed socialism could never work because uh, to have an economy operate, you need decentralized information in the minds of many millions of people all around the world uh, who participate in the international division of labor. And it wasn't only Hayek's, uh, idea, but he, he was the most prominent, uh, spreader of that idea. And so, uh, and when I look at this and I look at what Ben Bernanke has been saying recently about, uh, Incre increasing the powers of the Fed. Uh, it makes me think that uh, his years as a professor at Princeton uh, were either a matter of academic fraud or gross incompetence. Because consider this, in 1990, the famous socialist Robert Heilbrunner wrote an article in the New Yorker magazine uh, entitled Mises Was Right. Uh, this was after the collapse of communism, and uh, Heilbrunner had been advocating socialism in America his entire career. Those of you who are uh, uh, my age or older or maybe uh, 10 or 15 years younger uh, probably were subjected to reading his book, The Worldly Philosophers in an Economics Class, and it should have been called uh, The Left-Wing Worldly Philosophers. You know, he left out Milton Friedman even, uh, you know, not to mention Mises himself. And... Uh, but uh, but he he admitted well the great battle the great debate over capitalism versus socialism is over capitalism has won the intellectual debate uh, and he didn't entirely get it right as to why Mises won but he he capitulated now an academic a professor at Princeton like Ben Bernanke should know this uh, you know he doesn't have to necessarily agree with it but he should know this but uh, what is Bernanke doing now well I caught his speech in front of the Council on Foreign Relations. It was on television a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he's very smug and arrogant uh, in, in his outlook, in his appearance. And he sat back and he said, well, you know, when I was a professor at Princeton, I was aware that there were a few people who did believe that markets could work in a situation like this. But I hope there, aren't anybody out, there isn't anybody out there like that anymore that has any faith that markets can handle a, a disruption like this. And, and the crowd all giggled and laughed. The Council on Foreign Relations all giggled and laughed. And then the main purpose of his speech was to advocate a new uh, grand central planning authority called the Systemic Risk Authority that would regulate and control all risk-taking by financial institutions in America. Uh, I don't think the Soviets were even that crazy to think that that would be a good idea. 
And so that's why I said either it's academic fraud in that, you know, he knows this is a bad idea, but he does it anyway. Uh, but or he doesn't know this at all. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know this literature at all about the, why socialism failed. Or uh, you know, he's he's just uh, incompetent uh, as an economist. Uh, how could you ignore all the literature on the the great debate over socialism that existed uh, for the past hundred years almost? But he ignores all this in 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 in, in this speech before the Council on Foreign Relations. So this lesson number one that Jim Powell said about the Fed during the Great Depression. We, of course, are going in exactly the opposite direction, giving, giving the Fed more and more and more power. Uh, lesson number two is, quote, I'll quote Jim Powell again, deposit insurance must be priced to reflect the risks of the banks that buy it. Having the federal government provide deposit insurance inevitably introduce political pressures to offer deposit insurance at the same price for all banks, which regardless of risk, uh, which meant subsidized banks engaging in risky practices and contributed to the instability of the banking system, end quote. Well, that's what happened with the creation of deposit insurance in the 30s. Uh, what are we doing today? Well, we just increased deposit insurance. One, one of the first things they did. And, uh, you know, the short history of this, too, is uh, some of you might remember the SNL crisis of the 1980s. Uh, well, there was a government regulation called Regulation Q. Uh, bureaucrats are very innovative, aren't they, with language, creation of language. What should we call this? Regulation Q. Uh, it placed a limit of 5% on the interest that savings and loans could pay on uh, on savings accounts. And so uh, what was happening was what, if you could uh, put $1,000 in a mutual fund and make 17% in 1980, uh, but you could only make 5% in a savings account, uh, you know, money was, you know, flying out of savings accounts. And so the, the SNLs were in trouble. And so uh, and then bankruptcies were occurring and, and, and so forth. So what does the government do? They increase the amount of deposit insurance from $40,000 per account to $100,000 per account. And that meant that uh, the risk taking of savings and loans was being subsidized by a much greater extent by the government. And so a lot of this, the SNLs that were in trouble financially uh, decided, well, we'll take on more risk because if the uh, if this risky real estate venture in the Arizona desert doesn't work out, uh, well, the government will pick up the tab. Uh, uh, it's a bailout. It was a form of bailout. Uh, you know, privatized profits, socialized losses. And, of course, they did. They took on uh, a tremendous amount of additional risk, uh, thinking that it would be covered by this additional deposit insurance. And, of course, the whole thing led to a big collapse in the SNLs, and uh, the bailout there cost about uh, $500 billion or so uh, back in those days. And so what do we do and not, you know, 20 years later, some 20 years later, the same thing, the same thing, same, same dumb thing. And so, uh, you know, we haven't learned anything there either. Lesson number two. Lesson number three is this uh, about the Great Depression. Quoting Jim Powell again, especially because taxes are the biggest burden millions of people face today, it's crucial to cut taxes. Tax cuts mean expanding economic liberty. How about, you know, what a remarkable thought. Uh, but of course, we're moving in exactly the opposite direction. You know, government spending is a, is a good measure of taxation because every, every dollar government spends diverts resources from the private voluntary sector one way or another, regardless of how it's financed. And so what are we doing? We're talking about trillion dollar deficits for the next 10 years. That's what they're talking about. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Obama, who I don't call him Abraham Obama, I call him Abraham Delano Messiah Obama. <laughs> because uh, before he was inaugurated, the Democrats couldn't decide whether he was more like Abe Lincoln or FDR or the Messiah. You know, he's called the Messiah by in the, news, in the Newsweek magazine. So I call him Abraham Delano Messiah Obama. Uh, but, but uh, and so, He's promising to cut the deficit. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that's some, that'll, a promise I'd put money on. Uh, but, but he's actually proposing trillion dollar deficits. And so, uh, government spending, of course, everyone knows is ballooning. And that's a tax because, uh, it might not be a direct tax today out of your pocket, 
but it's a tax to the extent that all of those resources that government is now directing by, by politics will not be directed and allocated by private individuals in, in the free market. And so uh, there's a huge tax. And of course, he wants to raise taxes on uh, the most productive people. He wants to raise the, uh, the capital gains tax and, and all sorts of other taxes. State and local governments are, are all scheming and plotting to raise taxes, everything from cigarette taxes to uh, in Maryland now, they're, they're putting more and more and more uh, red light cameras up that take a picture of your license plate if you happen to run a red light and a, they'll send you the bill uh, with a picture of your license plate. And that's, we already have a lot of that, but they're, they're greatly expanding that. And so, so again, federal, state, and local governments are going in, in the opposite direction of, uh, of what we should have learned way back when. You know, when Ron Paul suggested uh, when he was running for the Republican nomination uh, that we eliminate the income tax, and if we did that, Today, Ron said, um, we would still have enough revenue in the federal budget to fund the 1997 level of federal government budget, which is true. I looked up the numbers, and if, and if you eliminated every uh, uh, every uh, dime of the f raised by the federal income tax, that's what it would have been. But that was even assuming that there would be no good economic effect to eliminating the income tax. But of course, the economy would would grow very rapidly. And unfortunately, that means that the other forms of taxes would go up that are tied to income. And so, so it would probably be more like the uh, 2002 level of, uh, of government. And of course, that is totally unacceptable to the establishment to, to do that uh, at all. And so, uh, so that's, you know, we're not learning that lesson either. Uh, lesson number four by Jim Powell is efforts to soak the rich will backfire because the investments of the rich are needed to create jobs, end quote. Uh, you may have noticed the rich now, uh, a good way of learning how uh, the Washington establishment defines the rich is uh, take a look at the alternative minimum tax. It was, it was established in 1969 because there were 159 taxpayers who were very wealthy who, were, who the government decided were not paying enough income tax. And so they said, uh, there's a, a special tax for you, and we're going to call it the alternative minimum tax. And since it was not indexed for inflation, today there are people with family income of under $100,000 who pay the alternative minimum tax. And so if you want to know how Washington defines wealthy, it's anybody who makes family income of about 100000 or more. And of course, Obama keeps saying 250, 250000 But But really, uh, if, if, he, if he abolished the alternative minimum tax and supported that, uh, then I would believe him when he said uh, 250 uh, is, is, is wealthy. But he's not. And so uh, uh, and, and I, one of my articles on LewRockwell.com before the election in November was entitled Fascism or Socialism, Take Your Pick. It was about uh, McCain versus Obama. And uh, so we got, we, got, we got the socialist. And, uh, and the argument I made was if you look at, uh, at uh, Abraham Delano Messiah Obama's career, uh, you know, he was a lawyer for ACORN. Of all the things, he gets a Harvard Law degree. What does he do? He goes to Chicago and works for ACORN, this uh, uh, Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now. Right now, they want reform right now. Uh, and that's where the end comes from, uh, from on, on ACORN. And I wrote about ACORN 25 years ago. I, I, I co-authored a book uh, entitled Destroying Democracy. And it was about the, the phenomenon of government funding, government writing checks to special interest groups of all kinds who use the money to lobby for bigger government. And I had maybe seven or eight pages on ACORN because they were one of, I had a big file of, uh, of data on government grants to all these groups and, and ACORN was one of them back 25 years ago. And so I, I got a research assistant to look into this and say, what, what the heck is ACORN? What do they do? I mean, what do they believe in? And they're, they're some of the most extreme, hardcore left-wing communists in America. If you, if if you look, they want to nationalize all the energy industries. They want to nationalize the housing industry. They want to nationalize health care. Uh, they want to destroy capitalism. You, you read their literature from 20 years ago. That's what they were saying uh, that was their objective. And these are Obama's people. This is where he comes from. He was their lawyer. Uh, and, the, and so I would think there's a, you can make a good argument that he must agree with their basic philosophy. If, if that's where, after he left Harvard Law School, that's where he chose to go and, and, uh, and start a political career working uh, with these people.
And so, uh, so yeah, soak the rich is is is, is built into uh, um, Abraham Delano Messiah Obama's uh, psyche. That's that's what he's devoted his entire political career to to espousing, and uh, we'll see if he gets away with it. Lesson number five is this: public works and other jobs quote jobs programs must be avoided because they increase the cost and burden of government, making it more difficult for the private sector to function. Well, of course they do. They, they, they divert billions of dollars away from the private sector to, uh, uh, to, to let politicians handle this, handle the money. Um, when I, I, in my book, uh, How Capitalism Saved America, I surveyed some of the research on how FDR spent his money. You know, Herbert Hoover started the uh, uh, tremendous public works spending projects to try to end the Great Depression. 13% of the federal budget in one year was toward uh, Herbert Hoover's stimulus bill. 13% of the budget. Obama's is only something like 5 or 6% uh, uh, of, the, of the budget. And so Herbert, uh, Ob Obama is uh, stingy compared to Herbert Hoover in terms of you know, stimulus bills as far as that's concerned. And of course that didn't work because of the principle of opportunity cost. It's just simply taking money out of one pocket and putting it in another pocket, letting politicians allocate resources rather than... Uh, uh, private individuals. And another thing that comes up in this literature is that the main criterion that FDR used for determining how this money was to be spread around was how big his vote margins were in the last election. Everywhere he had small vote margins in 1932, that's where he got, that's where the biggest chunks of money were spent. Uh, whereas he had big electoral margins in the South because the South didn't really vote for a Republican until Reagan because of the Abe Lincoln phenomenon. And so Roosevelt didn't have to worry about buying votes in the South, but the South, the Deep South, is where the Great Depression was absolutely the worst. And if you can make a case that there was a need for government uh, help, uh, certainly Mississippi and places like that, the Mississippi Delta would have been spot number one where you'd want to send money. But no, it would be places like Montana and California where there were small vote margins. And so there was a big pork barrel during the 1930s. I also cite uh, a report by the U.S. Senate uh, that, that showed that uh, people who had public works jobs in many states were told you have to re-register as Democrats if you're a Republican or no job for you. And so it was used as one big giant political pork barrel. And this, and I think uh, it's, it's kind of uh, naive to expect that this pork barrel, the so-called stimulus bill, will not be used primarily as a vote-buying gimmick rather than some, some attempt to uh, make, make us prosper, which it couldn't anyway in any way because it diverts resources from the private sector. So that won't work. We haven't learned anything there uh, in terms of economics, but it's, uh, it's a good political gimmick. Uh, lesson number six is that, quote, especially during a recession or a depression, the government must not enact laws preventing prices from adjusting to circumstances. Prices are vital signals that help people decide what to produce and consume, end quote. That's Jim Powell saying that. And of course, the whole purpose of the Fed's tremendous inflation of the money supply is to attempt to keep prices from falling, to keep, to keep the market from working. You know, we can't do that at all. So uh, we're not learning that lesson. We're doing the opposite. Lesson number seven of Jim Powell's book is, quote, Government must not enact laws preventing wages from adjusting to circumstances. Labor union monopolies have been major obstacles to adjusting wages, end quote. During the Great Depression, wages rose in 1937 by about 15%. So at a time when the only, the only really uh, hope you had to have a job in the Depression was to say, okay, before the Depression, I was being paid $5 an hour. I'll work for $3 an hour, uh, but at least I have a job. Here comes the government uh, enabling unions to push up wages to, say, $7 an hour, and the end result was very predictable to any economist, and you don't have to be an Austrian school economist, is more unemployment. Our friends Richard Vedder and Lowell Galloway have published a, a, an excellent book called Out of Work. It's a history of unemployment in America. Uh, they estimated, I think the number they give was that the unemployment was eight percentage points higher than it would otherwise have been because of the empowerment of unions and other other means by which wages were pushed up during the Great Depression. Uh, that, that was basically FDR's basic philosophy. If the government could somehow force up prices and wages, the Great Depression would end. He believed the cause of the Great Depression was low prices. 
Uh, not, therefore, if we could get the government to push up prices and wages, we'll end the Great Depression. Of course, that was foolish and it, and it never worked, but that was his basic uh, operating theory for the whole duration. And it seems to be what, uh, what we're still operating by uh, today in, in the government anyway. And as Walter Block mentioned, uh, one of um, Abraham Delano Messiah Obama's uh, campaign promises was to do away with secret ballot elections uh, with unions so that they could uh, intimidate not, uh, you know, workers more uh, when, they, when they have a representation election and repeat this, you know, you know increase uh, private sector unionization and, and increase wages, uh, and, and that'll create more unemployment. Um, lesson number eight is, quote, only if investors feel private property is secure will they be willing to make long-term financial commitments needed to spur recovery and boost employment, end quote. Well, announcing a new kind of bailout scheme, a new systemic risk authority, and, and all, to all these different government regulatory authorities day in and day out creates tremendous uncertainty and makes it impossible for any kind of long-term planning. Not to mention the hyperinflation we're going to get that will make economic calculation very difficult, if not impossible, for any rational uh, business person uh, coming down the pike. And so uh, we're moving in the opposite direction there. And uh, not only has the government been uh, 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 proposing more and more uh, different kinds of regulations and controls and nationalizations, threats of nationalizations. I heard uh, Obama himself a couple of days ago on television say the cause of the crisis is not enough regulation. We don't, we don't have enough regulation. You know, laissez-faire has run wild once again. Uh, it's sort of like the, the dumbest explanation I've heard of this, and it's probably the, the, the majority of academics who will believe this, is that greed is the fault. All of a sudden, greed popped up on Wall Street like that. It never, it never appeared before, but all of a sudden, uh, like, like in the movie Ghostbusters, there it is, you know. It vaporizes out of thin air, greed, all of a sudden. And uh, so, but there's not enough regulation. Well, you know, we have, uh, 15 cabinet departments devoted to regulating different aspects of the economy. There are over a hundred federal regulatory agencies. There are 73,000 pages of regulations in the Federal Register. Uh, uh, and not to mention state and local governments that have hundreds and hundreds of more of government agencies that regulate everything from zoning to antitrust uh, to, to everything else, to home building. Uh, you, a lot of you who are business people in the audience know all about this. And so, you know, we have nothing like a capitalist economy. We, we, there, there might be a few little tiny uh, oases here and there, but this is uh, this is fascist, economic fascism, pure and simple, which was, uh, yes, we allow private property, but it is strictly regimented and controlled and regulated, supposedly in the public interest by the regulators. And we have hundreds, maybe thousands of regulatory agencies, certainly tens of thousands of regulators who enforce all of this. And so uh, talk about uncertainty. And so the, you know, the, the direction we ought to be moving is exactly the opposite of what we're doing now. And what happened during the New Deal is that uh, re everything, everything Roosevelt did economically made the New Deal longer and worse. And we're doing the exact same things uh, today, uh, from Fed policy to regulatory policy to, to everything else. And uh, one myth that you should not uh, believe in any longer after you leave this room is the myth that World War II ended the Great Depression. There were about five to six million people unemployed during the Great Depression. When World War II came, the military, the government drafted 11 million people, 11 million, sent them overseas. That is not how you return to economic normalcy. You don't send somebody to sit in a foxhole and get his head blown off and call that the same as having that person working at a job and having dinner with his family every night. Uh, and the, the Great Depression didn't end, really, until after World War II ended. The federal budget in 1945 was $95 billion. In 1948, the federal budget was about $35 billion. So there was a two-thirds reduction in federal government spending from 1945 to 1948. That, coincidentally, was when the, the, uh, the, the economy took off, and also the Roosevelt regime was gone. 
Truman was not demonizing business every single day on television, uh, like, like FDR and all of his cronies were constantly blaming everything on capitalism and capitalists and, and economic royalists and, and all this, creating tremendous uncertainty in the minds of business people. And so uh, that's one lesson I think uh, everyone here ought to learn, that it's a myth that World War II ended, ended the Great Depression, even though Paul Krugman in the, uh, the New York Times uh, Big Mouth uh, uh, says it every time he gives a speech almost. Thank, thank goodness for World War II, the end of the Great Depression. But uh, it just goes to prove that winning a Nobel Prize doesn't mean you know a damn thing about economics. And, uh, and that's, that's it for me.